the box. You opened it. We came. Break out the whips, bitches, because this week we're doing 1987's Hellraiser, written and directed by Clive Barker. So you'd never seen this film before, had you, Phil? No, I knew of the villain. Funny story, actually. Round Palmer's Green, there was like this really beaten up hippie camper okay. van. No, the one you're talking about? Oh, you've seen it? Yeah. Yes. So basically, I always used to walk past it and I was always intrigued by it. <laughs> I looked through the window at the dashboard and he had like a bobbly head of um, Pinhead. So, I was uh... like, so that was my first first introduction to him when I was a kid. As I said, Declan, not the biggest, biggest horror fan in the world, so often when we do horrors, it's a new film to me. Yeah, it's a pretty unconventional horror film in certain ways. It ended up spawning 10 sequels at this point, most of which ended up going away from its roots and eventually really to become an absolute trash. Like the kind of shit that has porn level acting, it chooses to be a found footage film just for the sake of having as low budget as possible. And a lot of the time they were only bothering to even make films due to how the contract for the copyright worked. They had to make another Hellraiser film within a certain amount of time or else they'd lose the right. So you weren't getting thought out pieces of work made by people that absolutely loved the originals you were just getting heaps of shit but the original itself is absolutely fantastic and it's funny because the iconic pinhead like you talk about played by doug bradley with his incredible voice and really iconic crazy visuals is the star of the franchise but really not the star of this film he's kind of got a beetlejuice thing going on where you remember him the most but his actual screen time is really limited and it it was funny because even knowing that but having not seen the original in a while I forgot how little he's in it especially for the first part of the film he shows up for the first couple of seconds in the first opening scene opening montage even not really a scene and then you don't see him again to about 40 50 minutes but it's such a perfect use of him because he's part of what makes Pinhead and the Cenobites such interesting villains and characters is they're really not traditional villains they're not your black and white evil villain who just wants to cause havoc and persecute the innocent and torment people they're actually in some ways pretty neutral like they'll fuck your shit up but only if you come across the lament configuration aka the little toy box puzzle that features in the film and is essentially the portal to their hell dimension my thoughts on the film for the first time i saw it as you said i I found it to be quite a slow burner it starts off with frank in a market which looks like in marrakesh or you know like one of those rare oddity markets where you get like a monkey's finger like doing a wish and like that come across a mogwai or a, yeah <laughs> like yeah. a gremlin and then he gets his box and like for someone who hasn't seen it Declan I must admit I was scratching my head quite a lot thinking like what is actually going on in this he gets the box and then he gets transported into this other dimension the special effects where he gets seemingly like hung and quartered and ripped to shreds doesn't he and bits of his face is all over the floor and I was just watching it yesterday and I was like oh like I was quite struck by how how good the practical effects was even today and even when they're not good it's gross enough where it still works because it sounds funny saying it's subtle but it is kind of subtle how little they show of the beings and of the cenobites and of pinhead who by the way is never referred to as pinhead in the books or the movie series and clive barker actually hated the name pinhead he thought it was a really sort of trivial mm. unthreatening name for for a villain and i think he was only ever referred to in the books as the priest right which is actually a pretty cool name but i'm sticking with pinhead so he just got named pinhead by cinema goers essentially yeah they're just like describing him as they see him so it'd be like he is a pinhead it'll be like no country for old men mullet guy with the air gun (laughs) (laughs) do you know what i mean they're just literally but i think it's a cool name it's a great name even if he was called pinhead and as the villain's name i would take that man whether it's a great name or not it's never going to come unstuck at this point so you just have to settle for it but Although you see the aftermath of what happened to him, you really want to see the in-between. You want to see him getting torn to pieces. You want to see all this horrible torture that the Cenobites might have done to him. But you just see glimpses of it. You see his face getting pieced back Mm. together. And the funny thing is, it only hints at it, really, in this film. And it gets into the folklore and the lore of Hellraiser a lot more in the later films before it becomes absolute trash but it's such an interesting notion again because people actually seek out the box the Cenobites and Pinhead aren't going around the world searching for victims to persecute people that seek out the lament configuration search for it because it has the promise of the 
absolute ecstasy, the highest level of pleasure. But the only downside is that you have to take equal amounts of pain. So he would have actually sought out more or less knowing he's going to be out of his control and fucked up. But it's because Frank, the character who seeks it out, that is what he's all about. He likes to drink. He likes to probably do drugs. He likes to do everything to excess and he likes to fuck. And he will fuck anyone and everything, including his brother's wife, as we find out later in the story. And that's what this film's about. It's about sex and toxic relationships and lust and the impulse of it. But it's also about impulsivity in general and how that can lead you down such a dark, dark path. I'm glad you explained the backstory to it because... When I finished it, I had a lot of questions like, how did he find this market? How did he find the bot? Why does he want to get ripped to shreds? I I didn't understand it. I'm glad it gets explained later. I might watch the other films just simply for that fact. Second one's still very good. Third one, you shouldn't take it as a canon in terms of the folklore, but still a fun film. But first one and second one, you can take as a single unit. From using the lament configuration, is it essentially for sexual pleasure? Like someone, what, what do you call it when someone hangs himself and has a wank? Is uh, it kind of like... David Carradine special. But is it like on those levels? Like you're getting orgasmic? Essentially, I mean, basically, by the themes of the film and the actual design of the Cenobites, they're interdimensional SMM people aren't they you know they're they're interdimensional travelers looking for people who are seeking the absolute ecstasy of pleasure so that they can inflict it on them but they're always going to inflict equal levels of pain to balance things out again they look like beings that are beyond literally physically fucking but I'm guessing their pleasure is derived from finding entities or humans or souls in whatever dimension they go to inflicting the equal levels of pain and pleasure upon them how do people find out about it how how did frank know to go to that market to find the box or did he did they just find it randomly how does indy know to look for the ark of the covenant well it's mm. obviously this legend yeah that some people end up believing that some people go off looking for you know some people look for bigfoot some people look for a lament configuration it gives enough general sort of hints for you just to fill in the gaps of okay this is obviously this mysterious object that has been passed through time maybe there's more than one of them but people at various points points of sort it out to their own demise we cut from the deserts of wherever it is to this couple larry and julia larry's american clear american accent julie is just a bitch annoying as fuck a posh british toff we see him at the first threshold of this house subsequently turns out they just moved there and i'm thinking where is this house is it in britain is it in america and then then we see like all the statues of like mary and jesus and i thought fuck it this is in britain isn't it so we 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 see their relationship she seems to just be the domineering character and controlling poor larry from the get-go you got any beer there's some in the fridge oh well why don't i get it i got nothing better to do She sells it really well as well because the moment they're coming through the door, she's domineering and whiny and bitchy and, you know, throwing in barbs and being negative when it doesn't really need to. But on the flip side, you can see he is that annoying, placating bitch. You know, he's boring. He's a pussy. There's one point where they're watching a boxing match and he's enjoying it. Clearly, he's getting into it. He's doing that cartoonish throw shadow punches along with them, which no one actually does when they're watching boxing. She's clearly enjoying it for once. And he still has to offer, oh, we can watch something else if you want, because he's just boring. Caught in the ideology of women want to be treated all sweet and all nice all the time. Never poke fun at them. Never, you know, assert yourself. You know, it's that classic, why don't girls like nice guys? But when they're saying nice guys, what they're actually saying boring pussies and it's that same thing so i actually you know i i kind of felt for her at this point in the story i I, maybe not felt for her but i got it like i did understand it and i think as i've got older i resonated with what she was going through as a character more than when i was younger you know she looks like she's a bit of a bitch she has bitch persona and bitch face which i'm sure was part of the casting 
But also you can imagine a life where he's a bit more assertive, a bit more of a man about things, a bit less boring, a bit less predictable, and they have a happy life together, and old Frank never had to get involved. As soon as we get through the door, she's moaning about how much of a shithole it is. Poor Larry is doing exactly what you've just said, going, it'll be all right. Just annoying. I mean, you said earlier about the other films being porn level of acting. Mm. I did kind of pick up quite quickly in this film some of the acting. It seemed very wooden to me. They say a line, but the delivery of the line was very basic to me i don't know if you got that vibe yeah no i think it was a combination of at times just poor acting at other times a very cheap dubbing after the fact my lucky day hi you want to buy a bed not much this was an incredibly low budget film i think it was just shy of a million dollars at the time clive barker was a first time director i think he directed a couple of shorts before this but he'd never directed a feature film before he spoke a lot in interviews afterwards about how the fact that he was constantly making mistakes you know he didn't even realize that cameras had different types of lenses when he walked onto set on the first day of filming and everyone was very patient and nice to him and kind to him and the the experienced crew kind of helped guide him through it but a lot of the issues that you see in the film were partly down to the fact that he was so inexperienced at the same time though i do think his direction in this is really really solid for a sense of keeping control over the tone and the narrative and atmosphere i think he actually does a fucking great job it kept my attention the whole way through but i guess because of the times we live and constantly there's a new blockbuster out you're so used to seeing like production levels like that Mm. and when you see something lower it's a bit of a culture shock if there's one EastEnders level quality actor in a Netflix production say you really notice it straight away the level of production generally across the board the ceiling has obviously raised a hell of a lot since 1987 but the floor has raised infinitely Mm. and kind of permanently to a very high quality so we're set up we immediately get a sense that their marriage is on the rocks you know she's the stepmother his previous wife has died and Kirsty clearly doesn't like her stepmom she also thinks she's a fucking bitch she's not living with her she's already moved out her and her dad seem to have a great relationship relationship but she doesn't want to come over too often because she just doesn't want to be around her stepmom the movers were cracking me up as well the removals oh, yeah, guys yeah, yeah, yeah. how fucking audacious and creepy was the removal guy firstly commenting on his wife then asking like oh get get us some beers yeah getting some beer and then commenting on the daughter kirsty that's your daughter uh-huh got her mother's looks her mother's dead oh the daughter turns up and she's like, he's like, do you want to go for a drink? Like, while I'm moving her sofa. Like, it was just funny. Like, it he was, was a sleaze man. Okay. He was a total pig, wasn't he? <laughs> and it leads on to this really well done sequence where, you know, flashbacks are very basic conventional storytelling device. But I did like the way they lead him with a phrase as Kirsty asks Julia for a towel. Do you have a towel? Have you got a towel? Kirsty. There's one in the bathroom. And the way that just throws into her head a memory of when Frank came to visit just before their wedding and they ended up sleeping together and he was asking for a towel because it was raining outside. Frank, and again, also is another horrible victim of awful dubbing. Oh. His line delivery was absolutely shocking. It was so funny, man, the flashback, because as you said, it's a good way, but like the way they had like color graded it to be white, like all white and bright. And then they, he opens the door and he's like leaning on it like, hello. <laughs> and I was like, fucking hell, man. And then they start fucking like, I take it they was fucking for a while and this wasn't the first time. No, I think this was absolutely the first oh, time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because it's very, well, she hasn't met him before. Oh yeah, you're right. She's like, he's like, I'm Frank, the brother what what a slag he also says brother frank yeah well, what yeah. a cunt as well for fucking his brother's yeah missus. no he is but she's a bit of a slag like well to be fair though <laughs> larry is boring and this mm. guy she's clearly clucking for something completely opposite and her brother frank as he introduces himself is the opposite and they start fucking and as she goes up she keeps having these flashbacks and thinking about it more she even comes across old photographs that frank had left in the house of him fucking these various women like i said you know he was a fucking lunatic and he was 
was out for getting as much pleasure as possible and he was you know he's got all these photos of fucking all these women and different angles and she's seeing it and she's all these memories are coming up and all these old feelings are obviously bubbling up with them so she goes upstairs at the same time as this is happening it's in a cut beautifully with larry downstairs trying to get this old mattress up the stairs just as she's remembering the moment where she came with frank for the first time he cuts his hand on an owl and he goes upstairs looking for help from her and his blood trickles down all over the floors of the attic where as we know and we've seen previously frank was ripped to pieces and his his remains or his at least his spiritual essence having been killed there or having his soul taken there by the cenobites still remains in some sort of way and although on paper it shouldn't make any sense i think it's a really good example of solid poetic logic where the fact that this being the place where the Cenobites took his soul, Larry, his brother and closest kin, spilling his own blood, DNA and essence, and at that moment having the heightened emotional states, remembering that lust and emotion to do with Frank, all comes together to essentially resurrect him. Yeah, the way you said it makes perfect sense. I was personally laughing at this. <laughs> <laughs> because the, re- the reason why is, yeah, the reason why, like, obviously she's remembering the flashback. It's just like zooming into this nail sticking out. And then like all of a sudden you see his hand. His hand brushes against it like that, yeah. And then all of a sudden it cuts to his hand nearly falling off. With the size yeah, he of really a, fucks himself with, with up with of a cut like he needs stitches that would not happen if you just went like that against a nail you get blood yeah you kind of scratch yourself yeah exactly like this cut was like going like pouring but we need that poetic license and as they go off to the hospital the resurrection scene is fucking wild absolutely love this and for a film with such a minuscule budget using completely practical effects it is amazing as you really see him resurrect himself physically but it it seems like it's the remains of him that the Cenobites physically just left laying about that have nearly rotted away because he does not come back fully 100% solid he doesn't appear to have any legs just about have some arms and kind of resembles in the mummy when the mummy first returns but in a very uncompletely formed yet state but with even less physical matter and just the whole sequence is just fucking crazy i literally if you didn't use imitate from the mummy i watched that recently by the way so it was in my head that that was the exact example mm. i was going to use um obviously i wonder if they actually were influenced by yeah, that. yeah obviously later on this the mummy was years later so the special effects were pretty good in the mummy but he also goes through a similar process of imatep where he goes through stages of sucking the life essence from other beings and every time you see him he's physically closer to resembling a normal human while larry and kirsty are down the old a and e dealing with his fucking nail accident (laughs) that's happened and then she stumbles across him he's just in this fucking spare room that no one seems to go into like later on they just ignore this room but that's by the by there you go obviously she She's shitting herself because, like, she's looking and seeing some fucking weird creature. It's interesting. She keeps saying, who are you? I'd very much be in the, what What the fuck are you? Yeah. Help me. Tell me who you are. Frank. No. But he's saying it's Frank. I guess he has a similar voice, so she can kind of tell it is him, you know, this matter, Mm. I'll call it. And he essentially says, look, blood that's been spilt on the floor has brought me back to life. At no point does she ask, like, what the fuck has happened to you? Like, why are you like this? Well, to be fair, she she doesn't in this moment that we see. Yeah, true. We find out later on that she's been constantly asking for answers, and eventually he does give it Mm. in an awesome flashback sequence a lot later on in the film. The Cenobites gave me an experience beyond the limits. 
pain and pleasure, indivisible. Basically, the premise is quite well set up for the rest of the film. Find more people. I need their blood. I need their flesh. I need to come back to life. Mm. And this is where the film kind of really kicks into a second gear. Yeah. From, the, from the slowness of just moving beds about and shit like that. And to be fair, you can see she does wrestle with this concept for a while. Firstly, because she's just like, what the fuck is that thing? But also the boring dinner scene with Larry once he's come back and she's having to spend time with his boring doctor friends who <laughs> she doesn't want to hang out with and the stepdaughter she doesn't like who hates her and she's just bored by him and she goes off to bed and she just is bored. Like she's so repulsed by him. And the idea of sleeping with him and her desire for Frank has just been reinvigorated. So eventually she is one round to the idea of going out and finding new victims for Frank. Yeah, I mean, it throws up this whole question of like, I feel sorry for her. Let's be honest, Declan, we've all met these people in mm. our life. In my local, we call him like the pub board. There's always one in a pub. He's so boring and like, that was only for a few hours. Mm. And it's like, she has to live with this constantly. But at the same time, you do feel sorry for Larry. He's an ultimate victim here. It's not his fault. Oh, He's 100%. Don't get me wrong. Larry is the victim mm. here. She is a bit... At the end of the day, you can still just fucking leave someone. You don't have to stay there. Maybe she's also bought into the same ideology of, oh, you know, he's a good man. I, I should like him. Mm. But she just can't help herself. But she's not a terrible person at the start of it, even though she's cheated on her husband. You know, she's not all awful she's a piece of shit but she's not awful she allows herself to be seduced by her impulses and her desires and her basic animal needs and go down this evil path to the point where she's willing to murder someone and i like this you know this section of the film where she starts basically just going out to bars dangling herself out like a little flower for guys to come and try and fuck yeah essentially she uses her ultimate superpower of being a slag mm. like so, <laughs> that's her ultimate power really <laughs> This is what the film, I think, does good. As you've said before, it, it throws like these morality questions into it. It's not conventional. The first victim was an ultimate... I don't really want to use these terms, but he seemed to me like an ultimate nonce kind of guy. Like, he, <laughs> what do you mean? That's not, 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 not a real like term. Ultimate, ultimate desperate desperate guy like she, she he's kissing her on the neck he's got no hair he's got like one string of hair like baldness mm. whatever i'm not saying anything about bald people but <laughs> he Ball. look yeah yeah he looked like a just a shocking kind of guy like she's kind of getting reservations like when this guy's kissing her neck like all getting all mm. repulsed and then he's getting aggressive he's like you're not fucking changing now are you mm. like getting aggressive and i took it as this isn't his first rodeo he's kind of like forced himself on women before and and they're getting repulsed you can change your fucking mind are you i'm sorry let's go upstairs okay He's got a kind of sinister hate for women. I see what you're saying. I actually disagree in a way. These minor characters that just need to be killed off for the sake of the plot, they could have easily have been throwaway characters. Mm. Barely any screen time, hard enough to actually get any sense of a character in that moment. But they did such a good job. Each one of them felt very sad and pathetic in their own kind of way. I, uh, I get lonely sometimes. Everybody does. You know, a film that at its heart is all about sort of sexual desire and sex and lust. It manages to cover it from so many angles. And this was the angle of someone who's unattractive. No matter how unattractive you are, you don't have any less sexual desire. And, and yeah. you know, that pain of it. See, I definitely didn't think he was a uh, rapist or anything like, or he was a bad guy in any sense. But you got that sort of toxic desperation, desperation yeah. 
coming across and it comes out in that fleeting moment that rage that then he tries to push back down but it's because he's he's like like i don't think he would have actually even hit her or anything no matter even if she'd tried to like throw him out and change her mind but he would have been ragefully disappointed you know you get such a good sense of the characters in the brief moments you see him okay maybe not a rapist but I feel that he'd been rejected loads of times mm. and this was probably his hundredth time of being rejected and you know I felt sorry for him because the actual death scene she locks the door he takes his trousers off like at the end of the day it's sad because she had no intention of ever fucking him mm. she, she could like at the end of the day like she could at least fuck them before she murders them because it wouldn't really make a difference mm. at least they get a bit of something before yeah. they get murdered I mean but fair play like she doesn't want to fuck little rat boys but um she locks the door he goes oh i need to empty my bladder <laughs> which me... is like the least sexy thing you say know, just that before made me laugh. i was like he was there in his fucking massive draw like i know when he's like shook. putting his trousers <laughs> yeah, yeah, down yeah. he's got his old tighty whiteys um, on but it's funny because she leads him to the room mm. where frank's under the floor i don't know how it works really because now he's got a bit of a body back he's not matter anymore so how does he hide well he just i mean he, he just, just seems to be hiding in the shadows yeah, no one yeah. seems to be going in this room i'm not really sure how long they living for over the course of the story once they've moved in but i don't know just no one seems to go up there they haven't done any building work on it yet and frank just seems to knock about in the shadows mm, mm. there's a lot of random dresses and random furniture laid around that i suppose you could hide behind and the death scene's a bit nasty actually she gets a hammer whacks him like on the top of the head he's now cowering begging for his life as you would be declan mm. smash in the fucking right in the kisser in it and then you see him kind of just laying there it's good it's good effects again because his mouth's all contorted and it's horrid really horrid it's really done there's a there's a touch of sam raimi about how it's sort of quick cuts moving from the real actor to a prop head there's clear moments where you naturally in your mind know that's no longer an actual person but it's blended and cut together well enough where it's still effective in your mind as like a brutal killing and then frank starts mm. succubusing him i guess it's a mix between a succubus a vampire and a zombie because he's a resurrected living dead creature mm. and he eats their flesh but he doesn't eat all their flesh it's more that he nearly seems to suck the life essence from people as he's eating their flesh every time he does it you know now he's got an arm now he's got more flesh on his yeah. bones and the sinew around his flesh and he's starting to become stronger you know before he couldn't even walk you know he had to drag himself along when we next see him he's bipedal but he's kind of limping around and he's very weak it's very easy if you touch him to actually rip off a bit of flesh mm. you know it still feels like even though he's reviving himself the flesh that is reviving is still rotted so he, he gets stronger and stronger and we see him growing stronger how, how many victims does she bring about three we see three i get the feeling and there might have been more yeah. but I'm not entirely sure but it's also she sells really well how much she doesn't want to kill this first guy there's a look on her face the moment she finally kills the first victim where it feels like she kind of doesn't mind it She's it really feels like she's embracing her dark side and she even seems to enjoy the process of getting away with the killings from her point of view I'm putting myself in Julia's shoes here what is her ultimate goal to get Frank back to human form to fuck him the best way to sum it up is probably a story from the production where Clive Barker originally he wanted the title of the film to be The Hellbound Heart which was the name of the novel it was based on which on paper perfectly makes sense but the studios they were worried it sounded too much like a romance film which you can kind of see mm -hmm. it's also just not a great title it's not like a cutting movie title like that sounds cool I want to go see that like the thing about Clive Baker is he like if you look through all the titles of his books they suck like they are awful titles and I think I can't remember the other title suggested but it was, it was like 10 words long and the sadists from hell or something stupid like that it was just awful so they were like no mm. so eventually he opened up to the whole crew and he said who's got some ideas and they were all given their ideas and the 60 year old cleaning lady suggested the title the lens a woman will go to to have a good fuck and that basically sums up her whole goal of the film right right she is so enamored so needing to feel that intoxication of real genuine passion and desire again so craving it so craving the memory of it figuratively craving frank's flesh mm -hmm. to fuck him and literally going to these lengths to physically put his flesh back on his body so that what's literally happening in the film perfectly reflects the theme of what's happening in the film and that is it you know she she just needs that desire she wants to supplant her boring husband with this out of control 
rugged, exciting guy who actually gets her going. Could you not have just had a wank? <laughs> I mean, that works. <laughs> we, from the audience perspective, see Frankie boy get stronger and stronger, getting his senses back, you know. It's quite good, actually, the way they show the progress, because at one point, Julia's smoking a cigarette, and then he goes, oh, I can smell it now. And it's good the way they use kind of like real world things to like show you the progress. We were talking about what does Julia want? It's what does Frank want? One. And other than the fact that he doesn't want to just be revived, but he starts talking about, I can feel my nerve endings reattaching. And although he starts feeling incredible pain, because obviously he's still like an, a reanimated walking corpse without any skin, and missing certain body parts, but he's excited because he can feel any sort of sensation again. And he knows he's going to be able to feel pleasure again. And he starts demanding for Julia to come over and let him touch her. Yeah. But she's kind of caught between worlds because she's actually still disgusted by him and his physical form but it's blended in with this desire for what he can be once he's fully reformed he says at one point come to daddy which is really gross and creepy coming from like a reanimated corpse but that leads into this sequence where as he's physically becoming stronger he's starting to get annoyed with the fact that he's stuck up in the attic and mm. he's you know she's always telling him like keep your voice down but he's going around kicking things like making noise on purpose i think part of him wants larry to come up discover him so that it forces her into a corner to murder him because at this point she's not down with green lighting larry's murder and so he starts making some noise up in the attic and, and larry's like what's that so he goes up to check it out D to try and distract him julia starts getting jiggy and starts you know being like let's fuck so they start mm. get, getting busy on the bed she's facing the wardrobe and you see the wardrobe start to open No. No, please, no, no, please. I got better, please. She thinks he's going for Larry with the knife, but then he pulls out a rat and starts stabbing it and cutting it up to pieces as he's kind of watching them two fuck with this disturbing look on his face. And the whole scene is just fucking weird, man. In the Pornhub age of all the bizarre situations and sexual genres is pretty well known to the average person our age nowadays. Can you imagine how much it must have blown people's minds back in 1987? Well, it blew my mind still a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, no, not really, like. I imagine seeing it in the cinema. Does he does he hate Larry? Frank is a cunt. Or does he just want to fuck? He just wants the wife. And he needs Frank and he needs Larry gone. He doesn't particularly hate him or love his own brother. He just wants to fulfil his ultimate goal. I don't think he particularly gives a shit about Julia. It's, you know, very one sided. Let me put it this way. If he wasn't the fiance and then wife of his brother, I don't think he would have been particularly interested in fucking her at all, other than just of getting his dick wet like any other woman. It's made me laugh because I just imagined like Ryan Giggs and his fucking brother yeah. watching watching a Hellraiser and him just looking at him like <laughs> Pinhead in the corner. Yeah, he's like, this is a good film. <laughs> and then he goes and fucks yeah, his Giggs one. getting all hot and bothered and yeah. leaving the room. Yeah, yeah. So eventually Frank goes back into the wardrobe. Larry's none the wiser, but he's all pissed off because Julia's screaming like, no, no, get off me. And he's just like, what the fuck is mm. going on with you? Not realising that she's actually saved his life. Frank is pretty sure that he needs one more victim, maybe two max. And he's saying to Julia, come on, go out. And it's funny because we've already seen her kind of not have so much of a problem with it anymore. She seems like she's resistant to doing another, so I didn't really get that or why. But he eventually convinces her. At the same time, Larry's having dinner with his daughter. And he's basically saying to her, you know, Julia's having a hard time and this and that. I think it's the move. She's not leaving the house. Would you go and, over and talk to her? I know you two fucking hate each other, but, you know, she is my wife. Do me a favour. So she's like, yeah, no problem. And she goes back. Just as Julia is entering the house with another one of her potential victims, but from Kirsty's eyes, just looks like someone she's about to go fuck. So she does some investigating. And you've got a feel for Kirsty here where on one level she's braced to see something shocking she thinks she's going to catch her stepmom fucking someone else but when she walks in and she actually finds one of the victims who's halfway through the process of having his essence sucked away from him and he kind of looks like in robocop when those guys get covered in toxic waste you know he's sort of melting away he's part human skin part 
practical effect and he's got that weird meshed look when he's you know his eyes are sunken in and it's a really cool effect and if that's not bad enough then frank comes out in his weird no skin no flesh crazy hellraiser look it's one of those things where it's a film that's got a short running time she goes from never having been aware of anything supernatural to accepting a whole world of supernatural possibilities very quickly including her uncle being a resurrected no skin monster but the actress does sell it pretty well like i was actually really impressed with this actress yeah she out of all of them number one the dubbing seems to be best than her delivery of the lions was 100 percent the best out of any of the mm. the whole cast and i think personally she was the strongest actress out of them all i don't know if she had previous experience more than the others and then she kind of morphs from not having much of a say in the film to like some sort of all action ghostbuster unexpectedly <laughs> she becomes your hero yeah she's having a little tangle with frank up in the attic and she's got a box and all that and she she comes across the lament configuration and she doesn't know what it is but she understands by frank's reaction this is obviously a big deal so she throws it out a window runs away from him finds it again grabs it managed to escape frank and julia obviously discuss with each other like all right well we're gonna get caught now so we need to take this shit to defcon 5 it feels like julia's taken her final step into really just embracing being an evil fucking bitch so while that's happening kirsty's obviously freaked the fuck out completely disorientated and i actually like the fact that has a kind of a break from reality and ends up in a mental institute and i like that because it's very rare you see that in films where people will see completely traumatizing overwhelming shit and just kind of keep trucking for the sake of the plot whereas this she really goes into sort of a fugue state so anyway she wakes up in the hospital the doctor's kind of it's a bit weird he's like oh we found this puzzle with you you know i'm gonna leave it next year so he jogs your memory i got confused because the box seems to be like some sort of essentially magic rubik's cube kind of contraption. <laughs> so she picks it up and fiddles around with it and then i guess declan sucked into a hell dimension well she opens up this portal into a hell dimension in the wall of her hospital room and it's nice because it's a glimpse into the hell dimension and also a glimpse into the second film and the set design for the second film because the second film primarily probably about half the running time takes place in the hell dimension that mostly resembles what we see and she walks down the corridor for a little bit and ends up getting chased by this weird Cthulhu John Carpenter's The Thing type creature which apparently is known as The Engineer and it features in the first and second film and supposedly was supposed to be the builder of this particular hell dimension in the first place i think that's that was more his folklore from the novel and it never really truly came across to the film in the same way i'm pretty sure he didn't physically resemble this weird creature in the novel i just thought it was a giant worm <laughs> that's what i thought it. i thought again the special effects were pretty good like you know when it focuses and zooms in on the head with all the snarling teeth once she runs back out again at long last we get reintroduced to pinhead and the gang are they in a, another dimension altogether? Just in a in a kind of like holding dimension doing their business? I don't know if the lament configuration is just a portal to that dimension or when it was created, did it create that dimension altogether? And it's like yeah. a holding pattern dimension, like you said, that they just hang around in as they wait to, before they go into other dimensions that they can look for victims. I don't really know, but at this point, I do think they're physically in the room as much as they can physically be anyway, if that makes sense oh 100 and they essentially say to kirsty like we're gonna, we're gonna rip you up we're gonna kill you and at this point well she's shitting herself she's been through the mill man she's been through hell literally mm. like the box you opened it we came it's just a puzzle box oh no it is a means to summon us who are you Explorers in the further regions of experience. Demons to some, angels to others. It was a mistake! She's saying, no, no, I want to live, essentially. Did you know that Frank has escaped? And they said, nah, no, no one escapes from us. We're the fucking pin it. Nobody escapes us. He's alive! Supposing he has escaped us. What has that to do with you? I, I can, I can leave you here and you, you can take him back. But they go along and say, on the premise, if you're telling the truth, we'll go with you. 
and maybe just maybe will spare your life which again i love that thought that they're kind of like fuck you bitch like we yeah. talk like no one escapes from us what do you mean frank escape and so i love the fact that they're not even aware that he could have escaped because it does as much as they are these ethereal seemingly all-powerful sort of beings they're not all powerful and they're not all knowing it grounds them a lot it turns them into just these bizarre entities rather than these godlike figures they first seem like i assume from it all that once they rip you to shreds you're dead well i think they claim your soul i think they're in the business of collecting souls yeah but they didn't realize there was some sort of mechanism of essentially your sibling or your your own blood reviving you Mm. and i'm not sure if even necessarily that's a thing that could be recreated you know a recipe of add three step brother's blood and five parts lustful memories and dump it on the basement floor and you'll get your person back yeah so kirsty goes back to the little house and frank's with julia this is where it really comes to the head because julia the whole time has believed frank's on her side i'm gonna resurrect him i've done all this i'm safe essentially and frank being the ultimate cunt that he is being frank just kills her just Mm. like rips like puts his seemingly puts his hand into her neck and rips her apart well he i mean i think he's sort of like doing his succubus thing to her Mm. but he doesn't fully kill her he kind of leaves her half dead yeah and again he does it opportunistically because he's actually trying to kill Kirsty, who's come home frank has at this point killed larry and taken on his skin and it's really funny because he apparently have perfectly stitched every bit of Mm. his skin to each point on the muscles so that his expressions perfectly are conveyed but there's massive scars and gunk left all over his ears and the back of his neck but seemingly Kirsty doesn't notice shit at first she thinks at this point maybe everything's going to be all right but then when she wanders up to the attic discovers the body of what she thinks is frank because all the flesh is removed and then the cenobites appear again and i love this it's such a simple effect of just having the light come through the shutters and the boards in the floor and and things start to move and smoke start to come in such basic cinematic effects but it's just so effective and i think it's partly because the whole movie has this really cheap tacky aesthetic to it that actually really works in its favor and and really adds to the whole unique vibe of the whole film i think she gets an air of something's a bit weird in it she does but she's also she's probably so happy with the fact that oh my dad is aware of this and he's on my side and he's saying all the right things but when she goes up and pinhead and the guys show up and they basically say we want the man who done this because now they're pissed someone's Mm. made him look a bit of a mug in front of this new chick We want the man who did this. No. No, that wasn't the deal. He's my father and you can't have him. No! And she runs back downstairs and she's trying to get her what she thinks is her dad out of the house. And just by the way he's speaking to her and the way her and Julia are interacting, she puts it together what's actually happened. And that's when Frank is going to kill her, pulls out his knife, goes to stab her. As she jumps out of the way, accidentally stabs Julia. And that's what I mean when he seems to just opportunistically decide he's going to take her life force. Right. Not take all of it, but take a nice big chunk of it. Just before that, Kirsty had torn at his flesh and yeah, ripped really, a nice big yeah. chunk of his face. So I thought maybe he was going to put that back together. But I'm guessing the makeup team couldn't be asked to do a new setup mm. for another day's filming. So I don't know. He, I think he just did it opportunistically, which again hammers home how one-sided this was. He didn't give a fuck about her. You know, he gave a fuck about the fact that I'm going to take my brother's missus because that makes it hotter. And that makes me feel more powerful. And that makes another level of seediness to the thing that makes it hotter. But now that my brother's dead, fuck you. Frank's here. Bastard! Your dear old Uncle Frank. What the hell is that? We see a bit of a battle between Cenobites and they've got pretty cool weapons actually. They've got like hooks on chains and they like spin them around, dig them into Frank. They start fucking him up. Now you get that brilliant, seminal, iconic Jesus wept line as he's being pulled in different directions. His face is being ripped apart and you just know before they did the standard we're going to tear your soul apart bullshit, now that he's made him look like mugs, he's going to do the Marcellus Wallace pipe hit on Zed and the Gimp. They're 
properly going to fuck him up this time. Obviously, Kirsty's trying to escape. She comes across the decomposing half-life sucked out of a body of Julia on the bed. That will become important if we ever do the sequel, which I think we will. And the Cenobite starts showing back up. Because technically, by the letter of the law, she did open the box. But they're kind of not sure whether they should claim her soul or not. And I think partly they don't believe her. Because, like we said, you only find the box unless you're searching for it long and hard. And even if you find the box, it's supposed to be very difficult to open it. So I think they don't actually necessarily believe her that she accidentally opened it and she is 100% innocent. But that's bullshit, though, because she told them Frank was still alive, which they didn't believe. And she's proved it to them. Well, she proved that she will sell out someone else to save her skin. But, you know, that doesn't mean she's 100% honest and full of integrity. Yeah. And also, maybe they're just kind of like, ah, fuck it. Let's just claim her soul anyway. So they're trying to claim her soul but she keeps figuring out different steps of the puzzle. And every time she does, she's able to suck in another one of the Cenobites. Firstly, starting with the priest, Pinhead, and then she does the Chatterer one with the weird pincer things. And we haven't talked about the design of the creatures, actually. That is so good, isn't it? The weird thumb guy. I got the feeling... He had that weird sort of slice down his belly, and he, but he also sort of nearly resembled like a mutant baby. So I was kind of thought, is he supposed to be like a baby that nearly has a big cesarean scar running down his stomach? I guess so, yeah. I wasn't really sure, yeah. but I got that feeling. And then the freaky woman one. It, d- does all these individual ones, if I was to like look it up on the internet, have names? Yeah, they definitely all have names. I can't remember them all. I know the Chatterer is the one with whose like entire face is scary teeth. Right. Obviously, Pinhead, or what he's actually known as the priest. can't remember the other two but i do know that originally the chatterer and a little thumb head baby guy was actually supposed to have all the dialogue of the cenobites and the fat baby guy was actually meant to be the main lead cenobite but when they came to do the costume design they couldn't really deliver their lines convincingly it just looked kind of like cartoonish and stupid delivering quite theatrical and lyrical dialogue out of these costumes and it just worked a lot better with pinhead and it's funny because the performance and the voice is so impressive and iconic how did they nearly not give that guy the majority of the dialogue imagine if darth vader was voiced by anyone else apart from james Earl jones you know what i mean fuck yeah like, that sometimes it just by fate falls into place and and then becomes iconic the engineer john carpenter's the thing type weird monster comes out again and starts chasing them down a lot of the special effects in these final sequence there's kind of like a goofy yellow overlay light beams that goes over them that sucks them back into the box and the way the house kind of decompresses and turns into ash and explodes or whatever supposedly they completely run out of budget by this point so a lot of that work was done by clive baker and uh, some random guy he knew where they did it by hand themselves for all those special effects sequences over just one weekend and he said apparently they were absolutely hammered the entire time as well so he actually couldn't believe when he woke up on monday morning they'd even got any of it done so it's pretty good from that standpoint it's really (laughs) impressive yeah and it would be a shame to tarnish the rest of the film with the fact that some of the special effects in the last 10 minutes become a little bit ropey or a lot ropey in some places as we see when the mysterious homeless man that was seen throughout the film who was seen eating bugs in the pet shop and then walks into the fire and seems to become a weird skeleton dragon monster that flies off with the lament configuration he shows up as a background but prominent symbolic figure throughout the franchise and he's pretty much the one thing where i don't have any fan theory of what he's supposed to mean or what he does and he's the one part of it where i'd happily completely cut him out of the entire franchise maybe he's just like the guardian of the box maybe his job is to just transport it to places that it will be found again maybe yeah that would make but, sense but you know i was about to ask you about it because he turns up in the pet shop the cursed works i was like who the fuck's this eating guy? bugs yeah i nearly think they needed more reasons to have scenes with kirsty for the sake of the fact that in the second half of the film she was going to become the main character and the hero because she barely features in the first half and they kind of just have random scenes with her that don't matter like with her boyfriend getting off of her yeah. after the cinema yeah. and stuff well you can't you couldn't just have her like taking the old man to the hospital and then all of a sudden the next scene fucking shooting in lasers out of boxes yeah <laughs> do you know what i mean i get what you i get what you it'd saying. be nearly a dust till dawn switch up halfway through yeah. where suddenly it's just a totally different film but she was pretty cool like she was a proper heroine she wasn't acting like a dude action movie star saving the day 
but she was very competent and determined yeah. and brave, but she still felt like a real young woman going through all this. Yeah, it was good. Um, so then the, 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 the film kind of ends. We kind of go through the box lament configuration, goes through the, the, the portal and it ends up back at the, the market. I think it was just a nice full circle symbolic sort of way of saying that this thing will always manage to find its way into another person's hands and it is something that's just been passed all around throughout time. Right. That makes sense. I was trying to like maybe think of it out of the box of maybe it never leaves the area and we're just in sub dimensions, mm-hmm. but maybe I'm overthinking that thing. No, I mean, the the fun of films like this and the fun of when they don't blatantly tell you is that you can fill in the gap with whatever you want. And whatever gaps I filled in today, they're my own gaps. Like they're not oh. necessarily backed by anything. You know, it's just the fun of imagining what it means. Because I know this has spanned a lot of, as you said, 10 sequel, which Clive Barker said he wasn't happy with the rest of the sequels but he was happy with the comic that subsequently came out because it was closer to the source material so it spanned a lot of stuff what are my final thoughts on this seeing it for the first time i liked it i liked it a lot i think one of my main reasons i don't really like horror films is i started watching them in the time of you know in like the early 2000s or noughties or whatever you call it there'd be a new horror film out fucking Corrie would drag me to see it and i I'll be like, nah, Corey, this looks fucking shit, man. I can't be asked to watch this. And it'll be a recycled slasher thing. It'll be teams like, oh, he's gonna die. Like, and then it would transpire to be that. No originality. That's why I got bored of it. That's why I fell out of love with it. It was so refreshing for me to see a horror film, which was nothing like that, on an original premise with original, I'm not gonna call them monsters, but, you know, they were neutral. And I found that really refreshing to have the ability to be like that's clearly the villain with a knife running about in a mask like hit bar oh, watch out for him like trying to make my own conclusions from it and i found that really refreshing and i really enjoyed it yeah i 100 percent recommend this film if you watch this show before you know there's a lot of obvious reasons why you'd know we're gonna love this film you know the practical effects are wonderful and crazy but it's also just the fact that as a horror film it's so anti formulaic you 100 percent don't know where it's going when it first gets into the story and it doesn't have your conventional villains you know your villains could easily have become your heroes if they've taken slightly different paths or slightly different choices we have these interdimensional sadist beings looking for victims to inflict equal pleasure and pain but like you said they're neutral beings and they aren't just looking for any old victim it only needs to be people who have seeked it out and in that sense deserve it the real villains are the human characters and like anything from the walking dead or other great iconic films and tv shows in the horror genre a lot of the time the most interesting villains are even in supernatural or sci-fi type movies are the human characters and that's what's so fun about this film and if you like that then the second and third film and even some of the awful other ones after that you're going to absolutely love because it expands on all that so much and we really get into a sense of who these interdimensional beings are and what it's all about but again it's also interesting because you know horror films like to either symbolically or directly tap into specific fears we have as people and but one of the most common and profound and universal fears we have is to do with lust and sex and betrayal by a partner it's the one fear that probably everyone experiences in their life in the most profound sense and yet it's such an untapped source in horror you just don't see it really very often certainly not to this standard and that's why you know it's so it's it all these things come together to make this such a unique film and like i said it's cheap it's tacky looking the dubbing is awful sometimes the acting is awful but don't let that put you off because if you can embrace that that all becomes part of the charm of this film so that's an easy recommendation for hellraiser we'll tear your soul apart 